Over our next few studies together, I want us to uh, look at certain parts of the Bible uh, which set out for us what I believe to be some of the most important foundations upon which we are to build and sustain and keep our faith. And that's why I have already read this morning to you the account of Isaiah's first meeting uh, with God. For I think what Isaiah tells us here about his experience uh, is one that we ourselves can learn from and apply uh, to our own experience. Now the interesting thing about this account is we're told that all this happened in the year that King Uzziah died. Now that may not mean much to most of us because we don't necessarily know our Old Testament history that well. But if you did know that history you would know that Uzziah's reign was one of the longest in the whole of the Old Testament. Uh, He was sort of the Old Testament equivalent of Queen Victoria or Queen Elizabeth I. Uh, he reigned for a very long period of time. And of course the thing about peri- uh, long reigns is that as they come to an end, uh, they leave people with a great deal of uncertainty and anxiety about the future. Uh, what are things going to be like? Who's going to follow on? How are they going to lead? Uh, and very often at those times, Uh, those anxieties are expressed in such a way that people begin to think about spiritual things. I wonder whether that was true for Isaiah. Whether Uzziah had died or was dying, uh, perhaps Isaiah went to church, uh, as it were, in the Old Testament temple because uh, he had some anxieties about the future, some personal concerns. And he thought, perhaps now I need to uh, get God into my life in some way or another. Well, whether that's the background or not, we cannot be completely sure. But what we do know is that what he goes on to say, uh, what he goes on to describe, uh, is something from which uh, we can learn a great deal. The first thing we're told, uh, by way of detail in this story, uh, is that he saw the Lord high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. There was something immense about the God he encountered. Uh, the mere tassels of his robe, as it were, filled this place of worship. Uh, and, and, and Isaiah is trying to express to us the, the sheer immensity of the God that he perceived in this vision that he had. God, he said, is immense. I was struck by the absolute immensity of God. And then he tells us that these creatures, the seraphim, and I want to come back to them in a moment or two, uh, were singing. They were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. I've told you before that when I studied uh, the Hebrew language of the Old Testament, one of the lessons that I learnt was that in order to express comparative and superlative ideas, you know, good, better, best, Uh, The Hebrew language doesn't have comparatives and superlatives, so the only way to express it is to repeat the word. If you want to express something that's very good, you say good, good. Uh, That's the way it's done. Uh, Or good, good, exceedingly. If you want to express something that is very, very good. Um, But you never repeat the word more than once. The only occasion in the whole of the language, the the literature uh, of the Hebrew Uh, language uh, in which a word is repeated more than twice is here in this passage holy, holy, holy Isaiah wants to convey to us this awesome holiness of God the unparalleled, uh, unparalleled, incomparable holiness of God if God is utterly immense he is also incomparably holy. Now what does the word holy mean? It's one of those words we use so often, like blessed, when we come to church we use words like blessed and holy and so on and so forth, uh, and they, they're evaporated of all meaning because we repeat them so often. So what does holy mean? Well, simply it means completely separate. That's its basic meaning. Completely separate. So holy, holy, holy 
Isaiah is saying his experience of God when he encountered him in the temple was that he was so unutterably different that it was inexpressible, that God is inexpressibly different from human beings. That all that we might conceive of, of human beings, and even if we transposed it onto the higher plane and said God must be like that, Isaiah said he's incomprehensibly greater than that. He's incomprehensibly separate from us. Some of the great Christian writers have spoken uh, of uh, the cloud of unknowing. What they mean is this, that the, more, the closer we get to God, the more the whole thing becomes impenetrable. Our, our conception of God becomes uh, such that we get lost in a cloud because it's so unutterably, the experience of God is so unutterably different than anything we could possibly imagine. Now the other thing that's interesting here are these seraphim. Uh, sometimes the Bible doesn't translate words, it simply transliterates them. So seraphim is actually a Hebrew word. So what does seraphim mean? Seraphim comes from the word saraph, which means to burn. So these are burning ones. They're often painted uh, as if they were all, all fire. And, and, and that's in some ways what Isaiah's trying to communicate. They were fiery. And fire, of course, is the purifier. Fire purifies. You put uh, your golden nugget into the crucible and you light it with, uh, and you fire it. Uh, and it gets rid of all the impurities. Here, th here these creatures are described as the greatest of all God's creatures. Uh, they're fiery ones. They're utterly pure. But you see what they do? They put their wings in front of their faces. Because God is inexpressibly <coughs> pure. And that's what Isaiah encountered. A God who is immense. A God who is incomparably, in, incomprehensibly different than anything we can imagine. Incomprehensibly, incomprehensibly big and utterably pure. It's not a surprise then that we see both the response of the temple and Isaiah's response. The response of the temple at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the threshold shook and the temple was filled with smoke. It's almost as though the temple is described as having, knock, having its knees knock uh, in the experience of God that was revealed to Isaiah but then we have Isaiah's response woe to me I am ruined for I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips my eyes have seen the king the Lord almighty it's one of the characteristics again of Hebrew literature that when it speaks of the outward uh, characteristic, the lips it refers to the inward character so it refers to the heart so here uh, Isaiah is saying that when I saw what I saw I became convicted of my unclean heart which was revealed in particular here uh, through the lips he recognised that simply he was a sinner you may not have known the word. We may not necessarily know exactly what the word means, but what Isaiah is saying, I became aware that if this is what God is like, I'm ruined because I'm unutterably imperfect. Indeed, I am corrupt in my innermost heart. And he acknowledges that not only is this true of him, it's true of the people among whom he lives and it's true of their very nature. He recognises that he has failed, uh, that that failure arises from uh, deep inner uh, impurity and corruption within him and he recognises that this is characteristic of everyone in the world that he knows. It's bad news, or it might have been bad news were it not for the sequel. 
we're told this aren't we then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand which he'd taken with tongs from the altar now why the altar? in the temple there were a number of different sacrifices that took place and they're described in earlier parts of the Old Testament but in particular there was what was known as the Holocaust in other words it was a a sacrifice in which the whole of the offering was consumed by fire some of the other offerings they were bits given to the priests and so on and so forth or or you might share it uh, among yourselves but there was one sacrifice the sacrifice of atonement that was a holocaust it was it can everything was consumed by fire in the sacrifice and that is what is described here and it's a coal from that that is brought and is applied to the point of Isaiah's need one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand which he'd taken with tongs from the altar with it he touched my mouth and said see this has touched your lips two things are then described your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for the theologians refer to words of expiation and propitiation uh, to describe what is expressed here but they can be simply expressed in other language on the one hand Isaiah needed payment price to be made for his sins if he stands before God uh, and uh, he has sinned uh, then a payment price needs to be made to God Uh, and that's what expiation means propitiation means that God uh, to whom we must pay our debts for sin is also a God who is holy wrath against sin and his anger must be set aside he must be propitiated and both those things are described here see this has touched your lips your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for Isaiah actually discovers uh, in his response of hopelessness and helplessness to this vision of God in all his greatness and in particular God as a holy God uh, who's before whom even the seraphim must veil their faces because of his holiness he discovers that God himself has made a way back into fellowship with himself Isaiah's response then I heard the voice of the Lord saying whom shall I send and who will go for us and I said here am I send me his response was of loving obedience to the one who had revealed himself uh, as uh, his saviour and redeemer but I want you to notice one other thing and this if you like comforts me if it doesn't comfort you and that is uh, when he is given his charge of what to do he is not told Isaiah go and be successful in fact he's told Isaiah the task I have given to you you will not be successful you'll be a failure by any standards by which folk might judge uh, your competence you'll go and you'll preach and nobody will listen and that will be your lifelong experience because what God was seeking from Isaiah was not success but what uh, I've the phrase I've used borrowed from someone else uh, and I think I've used it before a long obedience in the same direction God is not interested in your success or mine he's not interested in whether we can get brownie points uh, and say look what a good uh, Christian I am He, he looks for you and me and he wants us to faithfully follow him through thick and through thin and let's face it for most of us there is more thin than thick that's what he's looking for when, he comes to, when it comes to the end of our pilgrimage it, 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 we, the welcome we will get in glory will not be on the basis of what we've achieved but on our obedience and our faithfulness well done you good and faithful servant that's what God's looking for and he was looking for that in Isaiah as he looks for it uh, in us now Isaiah tells his story not to suggest that everyone who becomes a Christian uh, or a follower of, of, of God will have an experience just like him no one else has ever had an experience uh, like uh, Isaiah but he does tell his story uh, to help us understand uh, what we need to discover too that here lie some of the most important foundations of our life before God I had a bit of time on Thursday morning when I was in Edinburgh waiting to go to the airport to collect my plane 
And, and so I went uh, into the National Gallery. I like wandering into art galleries. And I went into the National Gallery there and there were several paintings that really struck me. But there was one I want to share with you uh, this morning. I want you to imagine uh, the scene. It's not a big picture, it's about this size. Uh, it was painted by Holbein. And uh, in the centre of the picture, there is a tree. And sitting at the foot of the tree uh, is someone who is described as man. So this is representative man sitting under the tree. And on each side uh, of the tree, uh, there is a hill. And uh, on top of each hill, there is a person on Halfway down the hill, on each side, there's a cross. Half at the bottom of the hill is a tomb. Okay? You got the picture. Now, on one side, uh, the picture is dark. On the first side, the picture is dark. Okay? Uh, and there's red colours and the colours of anger and so on. Uh, and right at the top, there is Moses being given the law. And it says, LAW! And then underneath law, you see uh, Adam and Eve. And we're told sin, law, sin. And underneath sin is death. And there you have got a tomb with a skeleton in it. And uh, on the cross, on that side of the picture, there is the serpent that snakes around the cross. A reminder of that story in the wilderness, you remember, when uh, those who looked to the serpent lifted up on a pole was saved and, and it says uh, on this cross mysterious redemption in other words it's saying in the Old Testament there was a means back to God uh, the sort of way that Isaiah discovered but it was still a mystery on the other side opposite <coughs> law on top of the hill is grace on the other hill so on the, on the New Testament side is grace and on opposite to Adam and Eve uh, is Jesus, the, the Lamb of God depicted. And then at the bottom, uh, instead of uh, uh, a grave with a corpse in it, there is a grave with a corpse, but arising from the grave uh, is, is a person being resurrected who is trampling on the corpse and also trampling on a little devil that's hiding underneath uh, the grave. So sin and death and the devil himself are conquered by the Lamb of God through the grace that is revealed through the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, it's a very vivid picture. Uh, and um, then you've got, so you've got the tree in the middle and of course man is being presented with the challenge. And uh, one of the things in the picture that isn't parallel is that on each side of the tree, on this side of the tree, there is Isaiah on the dark side of the tree, Isaiah. On the bright side of the tree, there's John the Baptist. John the Baptist is pointing. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But on the other side of the tree, Isaiah is pointing too. Instead of pointing that way, he's pointing the same way. Uh, and he's pointing to the promise that he makes in his own preaching of the one uh, who will come. Emmanuel, who will be born and will bear the sins uh, of the world. Uh, I found that a very powerful picture and I stood there for quite some time looking at it. I might even buy myself a copy of it. There, there was another one I might tell you about another time. But there was this one was, was such a powerful picture uh, that uh, I wanted to share it with you. But you see, what it is doing, it is showing us what Isaiah wanted us to grasp. Uh, what he wanted us to understand was that uh, if we stood with him under the judgment of God's law, then we are subject to sin and to death. But because of the grace that has been made known uh, to him through this sacrifice that anticipated the ministry of Jesus, then sin and death and its condemnation are past because of the grace that is revealed through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, brothers and sisters, I tell you that because, you see, I think that the more we grasp that, the more secure our foundation is as Christians. I think it's the most basic foundation of all. If we grasp that, we can, we can single-handedly win 
every spiritual battle that is we're taken into because we have God on our side and where he's on our side where we're under grace where we live as those who are forgiven by God in Christ Jesus then uh, there is victory and hope uh, indeed and that's why I wanted to share with you Isaiah's testimony this morning because I think though we don't necessarily experience anything remotely like he did yet the truths that impacted him need to ever impact us uh, we need to nurture those things uh, come to believe them ever more firmly in order that we might be secured in our faith for time and for eternity let's pray together we thank you our Lord and our God that you have made yourself known to men and women in the past uh, you have made yourself known as a God who is incomprehensibly great and mysterious and awesomely pure so that even the highest creatures in all creation cannot look upon you even though they themselves are burning ones pure beyond anything that could be purified on earth but we thank you that the God who is the God uh, of all purity is also the God of all grace and we thank you for your provision of your Son to be the Lamb of God who takes away 